So we pray, Holy Spirit, you'll be our teacher, our guide, our comforter. You'll flow through us in a very powerful and very, um, just a very real way, a very authentic way in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, Dave Navity, come on, man. How about it, bro? Come on, dude. <laughs> Thanks so much for, this is actually the very first Love Church Story podcast. I've been wanting to do it forever. And um, we happen to be in the book of Job. And just after the first worship encounter, I get a knock on my, on my office door in between. And, uh, and there you are. It's so interesting that so many people have trained me. Actually, God through people have trained me on life and our relationship over the years, how much I've learned from your life. And, but you knock on the door and, and you give me the Cliff Notes version refresher course of one of the biggest tragedies, you know, that I can't, I can't even imagine going through. And you've taught me a lot. You've taught a lot of people through that process. Really, your whole family has. Um, before we get to that, though, maybe just for the listener, just how'd you get to love church? You know, maybe tell a little bit of brief background about that, who you are, um, you know, married, how many years, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, Kim and I have been married 43 years. You know, Let's we've go. been together 45 years. <laughs> oh, man. And um, five years into our marriage, we just about blew it up. We came really close to saying, we're done. And boy, today, I'm so grateful we stayed together, you know. And, uh, but uh, I, I, run a, I run a company that's a business planning and consulting firm. And Kim works at, uh, in Miller Public Schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she's a kitchen lady. Let's go. Foxiest looking kitchen <laughs> lady uh, you'll ever see. Uh, but um, so we were... Uh, we were living um, in Pacific Hollow off of uh, 152nd and Pacific, and um, we were looking for a new church. And mm. one of the big things that was really important to us was we had uh, three young kids, yeah. and we had some middle-aged kids, three older kids, and we were really needing to find a place that we could get the kids tapped in. Yeah. Um, How old were they at that? Do you remember what oh they were? Were they young teens? Because you know, I, I think been, Graham was must have been eighth grade or something like that. Yeah, I think they were. Uh, uh, Madison was probably still in grade school, but uh, yeah. Graham and Savannah were in middle school. And the wow. one thing I can tell you is, at some point in time, your kids stopped listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> and and so true. Uh, there's a spirit of rebellion that kind of builds mm -hmm. up in all of them. And unless you have them in a culture mm. outside your family that's investing in them spiritually, yeah. you're leaving them up to the world. Mm. And uh, so it was really important for us to find a place where we could get the kids and drop them off to a certain extent. <laughs> totally. And know that they're going to be loved and ministered and taught to people outside the family. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is the best way in the world to raise teens and make sure that the teens get on the right track because mm. at some point in time, they stop listening to you. Yeah. It's wild because I remember we were still at Peter Kiewit Middle School. Peter Kiewit, yeah. You remember that? School, I mean, absolutely. we were like in the lunch room. Yeah. And here you, you know, you and your family come in and, and I remember distinctly, I think it was the Fela's, they hosted yes. the the we called it, Rev, you know, the Rev ministry back then because I was the yeah. lead pastor and the youth pastor. I remember yeah. that. And I remember distinctly Savannah was like the cool, you know, the too cool for school girl in high school. And then Graham, he, we, we called him Grumpy Graham. And, and I just struck up a great relationship with all your kids and got to, you know, go through some life together with you guys. And I, I remember think, those early days. I think really days. attracted my kids to you guys, though, was that you were athletic mm -hmm. and, and you knew something about competing and all that sort of stuff. And so that, that appealed yeah. to my kids. Instead yeah. of just being a, you know, a basic minister, you had, you had something about you that yeah. the athletics brought to the table that I think really made a difference, especially yeah. as Graham... Uh, started playing more and more right. football and all that. There was a, a special bond. Yeah, there's a relatability for sure. Yeah. yeah, and that's the beauty of the church at large, right? You have different people that reach different folks in different seasons. And yeah, we really hit it off with them and super cool, man. So, so way back. So we're talking 2008, 2009, you begin coming to the church and 
Um, it's it's cool. I mean, even just seeing, seeing Savannah, you know, and I mean, really all the kids getting married, having kids. I mean, it's just been wild to see the growth, you know. Well, and uh, I think was that was that a- after I ran for governor? Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. So it was mm-hmm. after that, but yeah. before I ran for mayor of yep. Omaha. Exactly. Yep. So you got a chance <laughs> to see all the political oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, I stink as a politician. <laughs> okay. uh, so, you know what, though? Here, I got to say this. When you're, when you're on the small group call, our Friday small group, I've told you this before, man, like there's so many young men and young Christians that you've gone above and beyond to counsel, to care for, to minister to, um, and it's funny because we've talked about you and I very different in our approach, but the heart is the same. Oh, no question. The heart is always, how do we honor God? How do we care for people? And we're gonna get into it in your story. And you know, there's so much we could go with your, guy, your story personally, you and Kim. What I wanted to zone in on for the sake of this story is tragedy because you know, number one, we want to honor God. We want to help people, though, with this this podcast. Absolutely. And and your story of going through personal tragedy, you and Kim, and the whole family, um, it is. It's radically formed my theology. <laughs> I mean, just just your story. But as I study Job, it's one thing to study the Book of Job. Yeah. It's a whole other thing to live the Book of Job. Well, I can tell you, the Book of Job really didn't mean anything to me until I went through tragedy. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, and then and you then, go through it personally. Bam, it was like the Lord you. opened my eyes in ways that was astounding. So if you could go back and just maybe just share as much as you feel comfortable with sure. from that particular tragedy. Well, like, like I said, you know, Kim and I, um, we had some rough patches there for about five years and we got our act together and we had four kids uh, by the time I was 30. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's an older woman. Uh, she's 31, so she's a cougar as far as I'm concerned. Let's go, but, let's go. You know, uh, but uh, at age 30, we had four kids, and uh, Kim's parents um, uh, talked us into letting them take the two youngest kids to Florida uh, while we were with the two older kids. Um, and it made sense because we were just four kids at it's that a lot, age. Yeah. It was a lot, so we thought, okay, well, We'll take a break. And so Amber and Justin stayed in Omaha. Crystal and Benjamin went to Florida. And after about, um, I think it was about three and a half weeks, Grandma put Benjamin down for a nap, and she was in the other room watching TV. And he climbed out of the crib Mm. and went out the back door and fell in the pool and drowned. Mm. And so I get the phone call at the office. Uh, David... Uh, Benjamin's dead. I mean, it wasn't, hey, he's in the hospital. Come down and get him. He's dead. He's gone. And uh, I had to drive home and tell Kim and uh, the screams and the horror and all that stuff. It's the worst thing in the world. And uh, we had to figure out how we were going to get him back and what we were going to do in the way of a funeral and all that kind of stuff. And it absolutely positively just wrecked us. I can't even imagine. He was the cutest kid in the world and had the best personality. He died one day after my birthday. Oh. He called me on my birthday and said, happy birthday, dad. And he's dead the next day. <laughs> so um, as you can imagine, um, and I'm going to share kind of my side of the story. Mm-hmm. You know, if Kim was here, I know she'd, she'd have other things to say, but she's more shy and mm-hmm. uh, she'd rather have me here talking about this. But about the only thing I could do was sit on my deck and pray and read the Bible. And that's mm-hmm. all I did. I mean, I could not, I could not do anything else. And uh, the one thing I, I'll tell you is that the stage was set for bitterness oh, and destruction. My goodness. You know, Kim and I had already had a rough patch in our first five years. Now, you can just imagine her parents, and they were supposed to put something in the pool to make sure that if somebody fell in, their alarm would go off. They didn't do that. They were supposed to deadbolt the doors. They didn't do that. Mm. So the spirit of bitterness mm. 
uh, could have really taken root uh, with me being un, you know, unforgiving and mad that, you know, Kim's parent, uh, uh, the, the stage was set, but was, what was really cool is in the middle of all that tragedy, the Holy Spirit showed up and gave me a spirit of peace and a spirit of forgiveness and a spirit of love in the middle of all that. Oh my goodness. And um, it, he did the same thing to Kim. Um, but all I could do was sit on my, my deck and read the Bible. And one day I opened the Bible and uh, my finger was right on this scripture. Um, this was early on. Early on, mm. early on. This might have actually been even before the funeral. I can't even wow. tell, tell so you Wow, so within a sure. couple of days. Golly. I, I don't know. It was okay. probably it was early. It was, pro it was early, but I got my. I just opened the Bible. And my finger. Just one of those. Was on Isaiah fifty-seven one, mm -hmm. and it said, "The righteous perish, and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil." Ugh. What a comfort. You're, I mean, think about that. The Lord was Ugh. telling us perhaps that he took him home oh my goodness. as a young boy because he could see maybe what was gonna happen to him down the road. And he took him now instead of letting him go through what he might've gone through. Wow. So that was, that was really comforting. And the then um, uh, he took me to Job. Hmm. And I'm looking, and so this, this, is still is the, on the, this is still on the deck. On the deck, yeah, yeah I'm reading my Bible. And, he, and it might have been a different day, but he took me to Job. And you were deep in Job Sunday. Yeah. And this is really what, what got to me is, of course, you look at a guy who was doing everything right and he had everything taken away from him. And what's fascinating about the story is that his friends show up and just really dog him for I don't know how many chapters. 35 it's chapters. Like 35 chapters Seriously, or something I know. like that. And they get to the end of the book. And basically, God says to those guys, unless my servant Job prays for you, I'm not going to forgive you. <sighs> and this is the guy that lost everything and had boils all over his body. And now if he prays for you, you're going to be forgiven. But the other thing that the Lord showed me is um, at, the, at the end of the book, it clearly says that Job gets a double portion of what he had before. That's right. Yeah, I mean, so, so he had everything taken away. Yep. And at the end of the deal, the Lord, after the Lord putting him through this kind of ordeal, he had a double portion, yep. right? So it, it, it says, um, uh, so after Job prayed for his friends, then the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and he had 7,000, 7, yeah. 6,000 camels, he had three, mm -hmm. 500 teams of oxen, or 1,000 teams of oxen, he had five, and 1,000 female donkeys, and he had five. Mm -hmm. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Now, the Lord slowed me down there and said, Everything's like double, double, double. Double, 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 mm -hmm. but when you get to the kids, there's no doubling. Mm. He just got the same. He didn't get 14 sons and six daughters. He got seven, seven sons and three. three daughters. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, he did get double because the first set of kids that were taken, they're with the Lord. They're alive. Oh my goodness. Job is going to see them again. Oh, wow. So by giving him seven sons and three daughters more, he's got double. Golly. <laughs> the Holy Spirit showed me that. How about that? Just two specific words in yeah. your worst, yeah. diciest I mean, season of your you, life. It, it, it took me from being focused on planet Earth mm. to being focused on eternity and what's going to happen when we walk through the curtain and we get on the other side. Man. Now, uh, I will tell you, I, I want to tell you two other things about mm -hmm. this. One of them, is I also learned a lot about demonic warfare. Hmm. Uh, my wife would not want me to say it this way, but I was sitting on the toilet <laughs> one day yep. and I got done doing my business. Hmm. And all of a sudden I felt 
you're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your mind. In this particular season. In the, yeah. Right, right around season. the time when, yeah. when Ben had died, mm -hmm. I was so racked full of grief and I had so much pain in my head and my heart mm. that this, all of a sudden I started hearing, you're going to lose your mind. You're wow. going to lose your mind. Wow. You're going to lose your mind. And then it dawned on me, this is a demon. Yeah, demonic warfare. I have a warfare. demonic spirit right now trying to get me to be convinced that my brain is going to be gone wow. and I'm going to lose my mind. So I started fighting that thing. Wow. In the name of Jesus, you demon, you get off of me wow. right now. Wow. And I fought that thing for about five minutes and it finally left. Wow. And it taught me a really, really big lesson. You'd think that the demons would leave you alone when you were really at a bad place and your heart was killing, it's right when they pounce. Wow. Demons will look for you when you are at your weak, weakest. And try to pounce at that and time. And they will pounce on wow. you to try to take you Man. out. Wow. You'd think they'd give you a break when things it's were like, really It's like, all right, rough. the chips are already down, yeah. But I learned a lot about demonic warfare and a lot of what we have going through our heads at times when we are really in a bad place. Makes sense, yeah. It's demons that are beating us down. And so we need to be very quick mm. to fight and rebuke and renounce by the power of the name Jesus. Mm. Any negative thoughts, I think of 2 Corinthians 10, 5, where it talks about we're supposed to take every thought, thought captive. captive. yeah. So if you have Christ. overwhelming negative thoughts approaching you when you are at mm. times when things aren't going well, recognize that that might be demonic spirits tormenting yeah. you. Dealing with our it's own flesh weird. is tough enough. But I got one other story that I want to tell you, is that I can't honestly tell you if I was sitting on my deck and the Lord took me away or whether or not uh, I had a dream. But this was so vivid, I think he took me away, honestly. Mm -hmm. But the scene changes, and I am standing on a narrow road. And I'm looking way down this narrow road, and all I can see is this bright lights coming from heaven. It was so bright that, I mean, I couldn't see what was behind it. It was just bright lights. And then I could see in the shadow Jesus standing there holding my little son Benjamin's hand. And I'm looking at this oh thing, and, I'm, and I felt like the Lord was saying to me, David, I have him. He's going to be here waiting for you. Oh. All you got to do, David, is stay on this narrow road and keep walking towards me, and you're going to see Benjamin again, and I've got him. Ugh. So I'm on this narrow road, Todd, and then all of a sudden the left side of the narrow road drops off, and it's a huge cliff, big cliff. If you went off the edge of that narrow road, you're dead. Curtains. And I'm looking down at the bottom of this thing and I see a huge junk pile mm. and rusted junk pile. And it was boats, cars, planes, houses. It wasn't little, you know, cans of green beans. Right, right. It was big huge. stuff. Huge, yeah. And I look at the Lord and I said, what is that? And he said, David, that's all the stuff that mankind spends all their time trying to accumulate oh. to whether it's the cars or the boats or the right, houses, right. it's all the material possessions that people focus on and they make it what their whole life is about. And they fall off this narrow road because they make the accumulation of material possessions more important mm. than walking this narrow road right. and serving me. And, and they end up, screwing their whole lives up, and at the end of the day, it all ends so up go, in yeah, a junk pile. Yeah, exactly. You think about the houses that we live in, are they gonna be standing in 300 years? Yeah. Or are they gonna be in a junk pile? Right. And so the Lord just showed me that, and I'm thinking, my God. This gosh, is during this vision. During this vision. Wow. So then, all of a sudden, the right side of the road drops off, and it's a huge cliff. If you, fought, if you fell off that side, you'd be a dead man. And there was this molten lava river that was flowing. I almost feel like there was a big volcano spewing this stuff out. But it was, if you fell in that, you're, you're, you're torched. Done. And I look at the Lord and I say, what is, what is that? And he said, David, that's the pit of hell. Oh. And that's where people end up when they live a life of sin. Selfish ambition, sexual immorality, 
um, uh, impurity, uh, thievery, debauchery, everything you hear about in Galatians 5, Galatians 5 anger, yeah. bitterness, jealousy, envy. People that live a life of sin fall off this oh, narrow road yeah. and they end up in the pit of hell because they chose to live in sin mm. as opposed to staying on this narrow road. Narrow road, yeah. So now this narrow road's getting really small. Golly. I mean, I got a big cliff over here with all this <laughs> rust pile over here, Jeez. and I got the pit of hell over here, oh, and I'm man. going, man, I got to stay on this narrow road. Wow. And then I felt the Lord say to me, turn around. So I turn around, and I see all these people behind me. On the narrow road. On the narrow road. So a whole bunch of people behind me. And I look at the Lord, and I say, who are, they, who are these people? And he said to me, David, those are all the people that have your fingerprints on their hearts. And they're walking the narrow road along with you Follow because you. somehow, some way, you invested in them. When they came into your orbit, you took the time to invest in them, love them, wow. share the gospel, and teach them about the principles of Christ. And so... Your fingerprints are on their heart and they're walking this narrow road toward eternity because Golly. somehow, some way, they encountered you. And then I woke up. <laughs> oh my goodness. And this is right after ben the died. worst tragedy of your the life. Worst tragedy of my life. And so Golly, what that did, man. Todd, what that did, that changed my life. It had to be sobering. It made the whole it, it changed me in such a way to where there's really only one thing really important in life. And that is investing in my wife's heart, investing in my children's heart, and then investing in all the people that I possibly can that the Lord brings my way. Your sphere of influence, yeah. That's the only thing that matters. It's not all those material possessions Man. that I could accumulate. And it certainly isn't trying to get off uh, living in a life of sin. Golly. It's staying on that narrow road investing in the people that the Lord brings my way and walking toward eternity where I'm going to see my son again. Oh my goodness, dude. It, it, All that came out of nowhere. And think about the scripture, right? Narrow is the way that leads to life and there's few who find it. Yep. For wide is the way, the, the, gate, gate, the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many that are going in. I mean, what yeah. a, he gave you a, such a, an amazing vision of that verse in the most trying time of your entire life right there yeah. to set you up. And here you are, how many years has it been? I mean, how many years has it been since that vision? Well, I was 30 when it happened and I'm 64 now, so 34 years. 34 years from yeah. that point. Yep. And now it's interesting, let me ask you this question because you're 34 years from that. And if you look behind you now and you look to the right and you look to well, the left, I mean, let me just, just let me just say say this. We were so brokenhearted uh, that we didn't have a little boy that we could stick our nose in his belly and mm. tickle him. That we decided to have more kids, and so Kim got pregnant, and uh, I had a dream that I'm looking at an ultrasound and I see a little boy <laughs> thing there. So we don't even check. We get in the birthing room and out comes Savannah. And you're like, wait, hold on, yeah, what, what, what happened to What's the ultrasound? <laughs> so she gets pregnant again, and this time we go check the ultrasound, and it matched my dream. Oh. And it was Graham. Oh, geez. So then uh, we decided to have one more, and that brought uh, Madison into the world. Unbelievable, Maddie. Yeah. And um, I got to tell you something really, really cool. The first child born after Ben died was Savannah. She gets married to Nick Palmer. Mm -hmm. She has a baby boy. He looks just like Benjamin. <laughs> if you put their baby oh pictures together, um, they, and they look like twins. It's just <sighs> absolutely. And it was just a little thing the Lord did to just let us know he loves us. Lincoln. Yeah, it's just a, a little weird. Gotcha. And I got to tell you, now at 64, when you, when you look back, I'm so glad I stayed married to Kim. Golly. I'm so glad we kept the family together. Mm. Now I've got 13 grandkids. <laughs> oh, and goodness. 
And our love today together is the best love we've ever had. Mm. And I could have screwed that all up. Mm. We both could have screwed that all up, but we stayed faithful. We followed the scriptures. Mm. We, we invested in each other. I tell you, the one regret I got is the way that we love and care for each other today. If I could have just learned how to love her in my 20s, mm. like I am today, it would have made a dramatic difference. And we would have saved ourselves so much grief and so much yeah. frustration mm -hmm. in the way we treated each other as we were mm. growing up. But but isn't, the, isn't it beautiful the grace of God? Think about this, if you wouldn't have that season, you wouldn't understand and be so yeah. grateful. And I hear you preach that message all the time. Yeah. So think about how many well, young people I, out there you're helping, right? So you glorify God. That's what this whole podcast is about. Yeah. Glorifying God. God, thank you that you showed up in the worst season of our life and you spoke clear revelation from your word to get us through the diciest place, right? Well, it was of super our life. It was supernatural. Supernatural. You can't explain it any other way. And how many people are you helping? I, I, I want to go back to this real quick, though, because you said that, so you guys weren't going to have any more kids. No, and when, we were ben, done. when Ben died, there was something in you. And now all of a sudden you and Kim have three more kids. Yeah. And, and I mean, all three of those kids, I've had the blessing of just being well, able to get to know. Those were the and, three that we had start going here. You guys here at, at Love Church, amazing. you wouldn't even know Savannah, Graham, and Madison if Ben had if not ben died. If Ben hadn't died. So you look at that, and obviously in that season of your life, if some Christian was like, well, Romans 8, 28, brother, all things, you know, nothing that flippant weird stuff. But now this many years later, to then see that from that perspective, I think that's super helpful for people going through the worst trial of their life that we've talked about it a lot. You weep, you worship, you, you grieve, you glorify, right? You mourn, you move. Like there is a yeah. combination that happens all throughout that that I've just seen in your life. And Well, and you know, Graham went on to play football at Nebraska, so we had an opportunity to be involved in all of that. And, um, you know, watching the girls just grow in their professional careers and Amazing what kids. they've been able to do, it's, it's really been something. And I, I, I will tell you one other, I, I got to tell you one other story. I, when, when I ran for mayor of Omaha, I was polling in the numbers one spot. Mm -hmm. And I ticked off a, a big political influencer. I don't know, I, I don't even know what I did to take him off, but I did. And so he talked one of his other friends into running. Mm. And so that guy came in last and I came in third because he drew votes away. He ate away from some me. of those votes, yeah. So that was the second time I ran for political office. Mm. So I said, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with politics. And Kim and I had gone through a marriage counseling process that really, really helped us before I ran uh, for, for uh, mayor. Um, I don't know if I said governor. I meant mayor as far as the yeah, mayor. Yeah, you said mayor. Yeah. Did I say mayor? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so after I lost that election, I decided to go back and get trained in that marriage counseling. And um, so I've been doing marriage counseling uh, ever since uh, because, uh, you know, I tapped out on politics and just decided to invest in ministry all 100%. So it's just interesting the way things have <laughs> You know, ebbed and flowed. How he opens and closed. I remember yeah. praying into that in that season. And, we, and that's what we prayed. Lord, would you open and close doors as you see fit? Yeah. Because either role, right, is, is ministry. doesn't matter where you're at. We're full-time ministers. Yeah. Yeah. But your gift to, and this is what maybe we can land on this, it, to encourage you and Kim, like the heart to see people whole in their heart from past hurt, past yeah. abuse, yeah. past neglect, a lot of that, your guys' call and mantle to help people in that area is a huge blessing to me as a pastor. So I well, just want to say thank I'll you for that. I'll just tell you, most of the marriage trouble that goes on between two people have nothing to do with the two people. It has everything to do with all the junk they brought to the marriage right. that they end up reacting to each other because of <laughs> pain and heartache and experiences that occurred before they even met. That's right. And so... Um, it's important to get into that heart and figure out where the damage is done, mm. where the demonic torment is coming from, right. 
and where we need to break soul cords to other people, where we need to clean our hearts out and, and really get in a position where we can forgive people and invite the Lord to come in and take the pain. Mm. Um, yeah. That's, that's real important. I'll, I'll mention one other thing. After doing all the politics, it did set me up to be able to do talk radio. Yeah. And so Good point. Um, I do the weekend news for KFAB mm. uh, every Saturday, and um, I use as many opportunities as I can to bring um, uh, Christ's so cool. uh, uh, view of life uh, to the marketplace. And then I sub for guys when they're on vacation. And uh, I just really try to represent Christ in a, in a secular public uh, setting. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel like if God gives me a microphone that big, yep. I got to get behind it. For sure. And uh, represent him in the marketplace. So that's one of the good things that came out of politics. <laughs> so cool. I love it, dude. Well, we could go on and on and on, but man, for the first episode of this story, Thank you for taking time. I know you're a busy guy. Well, thank you for, for being uh, the guy that has stuck with the vision. <laughs> and uh, I can remember the humble beginnings. And when you look at where we are today, it's, <laughs> man, is it a testimony? It's a testimony and you of know God's what? grace, it's yeah. Just, just like the Holy Spirit came and gave me revelation mm. after Ben died, the Holy Spirit has come mm. and, and opened doors and anointed really things has. that you've been doing. Yeah. And it's been beyond your ability. Way beyond. And uh, just like it was way beyond my ability. Mm. And that's one of the coolest things about the Holy Spirit. Yep. When you let him do his work, yep. it, uh, I, I like to say it this way. When I didn't have my marriage right and I was still coming to church, and I was still in Bible studies, all of that. Life was tough. I felt like I was rowing yeah. everywhere I was going, yeah. and sometimes the waves were so big, I didn't feel like I was really getting anywhere. When I got my marriage right, mm. after going through the marriage counseling, and uh, began to make that the first priority of everything that I was doing, uh, and let the Holy Spirit really move, I felt like I could hoist my sail and the Lord had provide the wind and off we go. Oh, such a great picture. Why don't you, let's, let's end, if you don't mind, praying for the church because predominantly a lot of the church at, here at Love Church is gonna hear these stories. Okay. Would you mind praying for that exact thing, Absolutely. please? Just that the Holy Spirit would just, you know, any junk that's going on, there'd be some, some humility to let it go, that the Holy Spirit would just come and just move in their lives, please. Lord Jesus, I pray first of all for humility yeah. of everybody that attends this church and everybody that watches online. I just pray for a spirit of humility. And I, I pray, Lord, for a spirit too where people are willing to, to get real about their sin mm. and lay it down and confess it to the Lord and just be real and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've made these mistakes. I know I've fallen short. I know I've hurt other people. I confess that sin, Lord, and ask you to forgive me of that sin and cleanse me. Cleanse me from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. And Lord, I repent and choose to walk a path and walk a life that is directed by you with my Lord at being my Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father, that you fill me with your Holy Spirit in a mighty, mighty way. And Lord, help me begin to see where the damage has been done in my heart, where I've built walls around my heart, where I've, I've even made the confession that I am never going to let anybody hurt me like that again. And so you toughen up and you shut your heart down, doesn't stop you from falling in love, doesn't stop you from getting married, but you bring a tough, calloused, barricaded heart to the relationship so that you can't really love the way God would really want you to love. And I really believe, Lord, that the wife needs to be able to take her heart out of her chest and put it in the hands of her husband and know that in his hands, it's the safest place on the planet. It's going to be nourished. Mm. It's going to be cared for. It's going to be loved. It's going to be cherished. And the husband needs to be able to take his heart out of his chest 
and put it in the hands of his wife and know that it's the most respected, loved, cared for, and nourished place on the planet. And if our hearts are all locked up, because of the damage that's been done to us over the time, over the past experiences, families, past relationships, that kind of love can't happen. So Lord, I pray that you help us all see where our hearts have become cold, where our hearts have become calloused, where we've made vows that we're never going to hurt again in our heart. And Lord, open up the hearts of everybody in this church so they can lay down at your feet all the pain, all the suffering, all the frustration, and they can risk really loving the way that you would want us all to love yeah. so that we can, we can not only restore our marriages, but then we can begin having a huge impact on everybody we encounter so that our fingerprints will be on the hearts of many that are going to walk that narrow road towards eternity. We invite your Holy Spirit in in a big, big way, and we ask you to remove every demonic stronghold that has taken root in the hearts of our church and any place where the enemy has got cords wrapped around their hearts and minds. We ask you to cut those cords right, right. now and get us free so we can love and serve the way you want us to. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, bro. Appreciate your time, man. And uh, thanks for your leadership. Yeah, man. It means thanks, a lot. For, uh, thanks for allowing me to share. It's cool.